I have this chat with some of my big YouTube friends quite often. And right now, if you look at the psychology of money, it shows where kind of the emotions are at during a market cycle. Yeah. And right now, um, I believe we're tied to the anger phase, which is a lot of people are struggling. Public sentiment is really negative. Like if you look at the news, the world's falling. We've had world war recently. Uh, interest rates have risen. People don't feel like the average person feels like they cannot buy a house. That is not a good place to be in in America. Sure. What's up, guys? Today we got Spencer Cornelia on the podcast. How are you doing today? Great. And I'm very thankful this is only about 15 minutes from my house. So it's very easy to, to attend this event. <laughs> Save a lot of time. So Spencer Cornelia is a real estate investor and famous YouTuber. So we're going to go over the good stuff. And apparently I'm about to get confronted about house hacking. Yeah, so I'm I, excited to yep, defend my turf. Yep. I want to confront you about house hacking. But really quickly, I just wanted to go over your investment career, like as far as real estate. 2016, I bought a condo in Las Vegas Country Club. It's right by the Las Vegas Strip. It was a two bed, two bath. And mm -hmm. I got into the idea of house hacking. At the gym, uh, a friend told me, he's like, hey, man, I bought this house in 2012. It's like four bed and I rent, rent by the room. I rent to my three friends and yeah. they pay all my mortgage and I cash flow. I'm just like, I was so blown away. And then bigger pockets started making it a big deal. And mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, I really like this idea. So yeah, I bought a condo, two bed, two bath. And I was about 880 a month in expenses and 700 from rent. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden I'm living in a nice condo for $180 a month. I was like, man, this strategy is great. Yeah. So I was 2016 in... 2018, I bought a fourplex here in Vegas. Mm -hmm. It was a seller carry okay. type financing deal. Fourplex. I yep, fourplex. fourplex. And then I flipped two houses in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. Just following that. And then I have I have four currently in my portfolio, but I, I house hack now predominantly. Got it. So almost all your investments are house hacks. Right now, yes. Yeah. All, yeah. Okay, cool. So if you didn't know me really quick, so Star Real Estate 2015 as a realtor, uh, Went pretty good. Um, started buying rentals in like 2016, 17. And then met Ryan in 2018, started flipping houses, and then just went full on real estate investor, flipping houses, flipped over like 100 properties. It's incredibly impressive, man. That flip game's tough. It is. It is and it isn't, because that's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. But, um, but then, you know, I've been buying rentals, Airbnb, still wholesaling, flipping, and I'll do some stuff with real estate, as a realtor, where if like someone comes to me that wants to buy a house, I'll refer them to someone else and then get a referral fee. So anyways, all right. So I don't believe in house hacking. I think that it is maybe the worst type of real estate investing out there only because I feel like you could make so much more money wholesaling or flipping. And I think that I personally couldn't, could never house hack because I have a wife and kids and I feel like for me, it just, it would be too risky to like share a house with other people. And I have like a, a wife and a daughter and like, I hope you, you let that phrase become so popular that I have no competition. Everyone's like, yeah, screw house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't good. house hack. Don't house hack. Oh, we have no competition. <laughs> I think house hacking is the best way to get started in real estate investing okay. because I find it to be the easiest way for a, a new investor that generally, almost always, they don't have capital. Yeah. And so I think the easiest way to get into the idea of buying real estate and generating rental income is by house hacking. And you can do that with 3.5% down, 5% down, 10% down. Mm -hmm. And then you get the experience with managing tenants for the first time. And because they live with you, I find it to be a little easier uh -huh. in the sense that like you're right there with them. You, you learn how to communicate with people. Uh -huh. So I think it's a great way for beginners to get started in real estate. And that's why I yeah. think it's the best way yeah. is because the lowest cost of entry, mm -hmm. you can start generating cash flow. And let's say that your rent is a thousand dollars a month right now you're in total to live. That's rent, utilities and all this. Cause a lot of people, if you're living alone, you're, you're covering all the, all the expenses. So let's say it's a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. If you start house hacking and the idea of house hacking is to rent by the bedroom and then therefore live, live for zero. Yeah. That's a thousand dollars a month, $12,000 a year in pure cash flow that that individual has yeah. to now invest in maybe flipping houses or if they want to continue house hacking or yeah. put money in the stock market, whatever it is, they now have the benefit of doing that. Yeah. My problem with that is People always come to me and they're like, hey, Brian, I want to start real estate. You know, I want to I want to build passive income and then, you know, be financially free and all that crap. I, I don't believe in passive income. Also, I believe that having rentals is actually a lot of work. Um, you don't make as much passive uh, income as people think. Even like your example of like, 
oh, I get a thousand dollars in rent and it covers all everything for uh, my personal rent. And I save twelve thousand dollars a year. Like if that tenant doesn't pay, if there's a vacancy, if something breaks, if there's an issue like that, twelve K quickly diminishes and it could be six K and it took you a year to make that six K. That's my problem with it. So with like flipping houses, for example, obviously you could lose money. We could talk about that later. But my average flip was twenty five to a hundred something thousand dollars. And it could take me anywhere from three to eight to 12 months, but it's still more money. And I can do it like multiple times at once. So that's why I always tell people, I think they should start off flipping or wholesaling because then you could get big chunks of money. And then uh, I big chunk, big chunks of money and then go buy rentals because I don't think it's smart to go buy rentals first. I think you should have at least $100,000 in your bank account before you buy rentals. That's my opinion. This is the beauty of life. Everyone can have different perspective. Your perspective on real estate is far different than mine. Yeah. And what you're saying is certainly not bad advice. However, I think the the reason why I just love house hacking is it is a great start and it does give someone that extra capital and that extra cash flow might be the difference that allows them to then invest in uh, lead generation services Maybe yeah. they can then hire an employee. I yeah. saw this with, with a, a buddy of mine. Once he started house hacking, house I eventually bought a seven bed here in town. He was able to leave his job and the surplus of cash flow just from house hacking allowed him to hire an employee for a, a caller and he became a successful wholesaler and flipper. Oh. And so I think, yeah, yeah. We, we both can actually come up with a system where you house yeah. hack first. Yeah. But to your point, yeah, like my advice is not for everyone. If you're 50 years old and you've got a kid about to go to college and like, do you want a house hack? Of course not. Yeah. But it's it's more along the philosophy of if you're a new, new investor and you look at housing prices and you go, oh my gosh, how in the world am I going to buy a rental in Vegas? If you want to buy a $400,000 house, you're going to need $100,000 in cash. So few no, people- ha- that's not true. To I buy it- I stop you. Well, okay. You can you can bring up the the seller finance. I'm just saying- No, 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 no. Yes, you need- No. So, okay. so this, this, is, this is another thing. So most people think you need 20% down to buy a rental. That's not true. Of course, I'm just saying. Yeah. For in the in the in the large scope of like when you're giving out general generic advice to a large group of people, generally you're gonna need twenty to twenty five percent. Yes, I've bought a house with fifteen percent down. I bought a house with eight percent down investment property. So like I know the game. Yeah, I'm just saying generally. Or what speaking. about or what about even the burst strategy? You could do that f- with less than twenty percent. Never, man. Yeah, that's hard. Dude, everything you're, you're is talking, hard. Well, no, no, I get it, but you're you're talking about like the the level of skill required to complete this level of investing I think uh-huh. is way harder. And I think that that is a good goal to have down the uh-huh. road. I'm just saying like the benefit of house hacking is a good good start. Yeah. yeah. And then you can determine if you want to continue in house hacking. Like for me, my goal is to actually grow this and turn it into a business with employees that I could then sell yeah. down the road. Yeah. So, so, you know, house hacking is not the worst. I'm being a little dramatic, but... No, it makes for good content. It makes for great. Hey, you got to go more dramatic. Okay, I'll go more dramatic. It's the worst strategy in the world. Yeah, I, I hate it. But I think it, it does make sense for someone who's just starting off, who doesn't know a lot about real estate, where they could be like, okay, I'll rent out this room. It'll help help uh, offset some of my expenses. I understand. But as far as buying rentals, I tell people what I think is the best strategy is it is risky. Uh, it is risky for sure. So first of all, obviously you have to buy houses below market value, never pay retail. I tell that all the time, never pay retail, find a property that's distressed, which is not impossible to do. It's not as easy as going on Zillow and buying the house that looks nice, but find a distressed property, buy it hard money, raise capital. If you don't have the money for the down payment in rehab, you buy it hard money, renovate the property, your hard money lender will reimburse you for your rehab costs and then refinance into a DSCR loan. Oh, when it works smoothly, it's so easy, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it yeah. But the same could be said with house hacking. In a way, yeah, so, yes. so many fewer steps. I've there bought, is fewer steps, my, but, but the scalability of being able to recycle, recycle your money Instead of like, all right, I got to put 20% there. Absolutely right. Let me save up another 20%. And I and I do understand like in my career, I've done over 300 real estate transactions by myself. So I understand like it's not 
as easy for someone who's starting off and they don't know anything about real estate. They don't know how escrow works. They don't know all these things, but that I believe that they should look into that strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, the benefit of your strategy and kind of your philosophy in real estate is the idea of going out and finding deals, which is a skill in itself that is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Even if you don't want to flip and do birds yeah. or anything, like just the ability to find deals and send it off to an investor can help you make side income. Yeah. So I agree in that regard. But what about your house hacks? Are you buying them at market value? Absolutely. Really? I don't care. Oh, I don't care. I just offer. What do you want for it? I'll pay that. <laughs> Why? Yeah, because I make all my money at cost seg. I make all my money in tax yeah. savings. But you could cost seg properties that are distressed also. Yeah. I think the important thing, though, is to evaluate like your decision making today is a microcosm of all of your previous experiences in life. Yeah. So I've had a very different experience in real estate than most. Yeah. And so you in some, you're a major success story, uh-huh. well-deserved, well-earned, yeah. Yeah. but very few people have had that experience. Yeah. That's and true. so when it goes a certain way, and I found with real estate, if you, it's, it's all about the first couple of deals. If you, if you play the flipping in, in wholesale game, like yeah. you can start, if the first one or two flips go well, now all of a sudden you have more capital. Yeah. Now all of a sudden it's easier to raise money. You have a track record. It's easier to find hard money. 100%. You have contract, like it, it the momentum is really important. Uh, and my, my experience was far different than that. I lost money in my first two flips and I've seen so many people yeah. not succeed in this game. I run a meetup here in town. I've met so many new investors yeah. that are just trying to get into the game and yeah. it is so hard to get your first flip. And so that's why, like, to me, I've just seen over a large scale and especially as a YouTuber who speaks to as many eyeballs as I do, uh-huh. when you speak about real estate, like, I just think the best way to get started is house hacking. Yeah. Or rent by room, by the way. You don't have to live in the unit. And so the goal that I'm trying to get to is to have a portfolio where I have employees, where it it is not about living with tenants. It is about rent by room. You can call it house hacking if you want, but not living on the property, being able to manage a rent by room situation. And that to me then becomes, I think, slightly easier and more scalable. I completely disagree with the scalability, but really quick, I want to talk about what you said about how you start off determines like where you go in real estate. And The good thing about me when I first started flipping houses is I was a realtor. So I had access to the MLS. I already did a hundred transactions as a realtor. So I understood comps. I understood the selling process. I understood everything about real estate. So I wasn't like gambling or speculating on how to flip houses where most people who come in, they're like, well, this house is beat up. I could fix it up and make some money. And then it doesn't work like that. It's very numbers driven. And I think most people come in and they're gambling. And that's what I tell our students at Wealthy Investor is like, I'm an investor. I'm not gambling. Like this is like set numbers. Like these three comps just sold for 400K. If I fix my house up, it should sell for at least 400K. During this real estate recession, let me budget to, for it to sell for 375 just in case and extend the whole time and all these things. But yeah, I... I And I tell our students when they first start flipping houses, let's say they buy their first deal and they're like, Brian, I bought my first deal. I'm like, great. And they come to me a week later, Brian, I just got another deal. I always say, hey, you know what? Maybe you should wholesale that second deal because you haven't learned your lessons from the first deal yet. Your repair costs could be half of what you think they are on the first one. And then you also didn't learn that lesson yet. So on this second one, you're going to make the mistake twice. So I, I do agree that if you're going to start flipping houses, flipping houses, especially, you should take it slow in the beginning and learn your lessons, like actually complete an entire flip before you go buy another one. Where were you when I started? <laughs> <laughs> another mistake that I know you made is you bought in Cincinnati and you lived where? In Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Here was the challenge. At the time, I was making $45,000 a year. I was house hacking in the condo. Okay. And so I I had low expense. So I started um, having a little bit of cash set aside. And then I was able to take out a HELOC on my condo because the market appreciated so much. So I had $35,000 in HELOC. Yeah. And so me and a buddy were looking at markets to get into real estate investing. How do I buy rental? And at the time, like I would need more cash than what I had to buy a rental in Vegas. So a buy and hold, you know, just going out and getting a 20, uh, 80% loan, value loan. And so we're trying to figure out where should we invest? And we kept hearing on bigger pockets about the Midwest. It was so cheap. And so in our mind, cost is all that mattered. Yep. Cost was lower, therefore it was a better market. Mm-hmm. And so we flew out to Ohio and did a trip in Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. Love Cincinnati. Yep. Got home and looked at Craigslist and 
was, oh, wow, I could buy a house for $39,000. Yeah. Of course I'm going to do it. Then the hard money lender was only $10,000 out of pocket. It wasn't based on any type of LTV or anything. It was just $10,000 down. I didn't know what I was doing, but that was the money I had. Yeah. And uh, I had a, I had connected with a few people out there. And so I was like, man, this is the market for me. So I bought my first flip in Cincinnati, Ohio. I bought it September of 2019, Mm -hmm. 2018, excuse me, September, 2018. Yeah. And did you, did you lose money on both? <laughs> did you keep it? Did I lose money? Oh, how do we get started on this one? Yeah, so what's funny about your advice is uh, the first one was going well. Uh-huh. I had a, a contractor. Mm-hmm. He would do the work. Mm-hmm. He'd say it's done, send pictures. Yeah. I would hire the hard money lender to for a draw inspection. They'd yeah. go out, check, 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 check. They'd send me money. So he did the work. Lender sent me money. I sent him money. It was no money out of pocket. Yeah. Wow, this process is easy. Draw, yeah. So then two or three months later, my agent up there says, I got a great deal for you. There's a second flip. And at the time I had enough for the hard money lender yeah. and I still had a little bit of excess cash. Let's call it like 15 grand. So I'm yeah. thinking to myself, the process is contractor does work. I get a draw inspection. I receive the draw money. I send to a contractor, bada bing, bada boom, the contract or the, the flip will be done yeah. in a couple months. And yeah. of course I had a little bit of glossy eyed, yeah. a glossy eyes. But so the second one, the contractor worked a little differently. He wanted 20 grand up front. And, nope. and uh, so I gave it to him. Yeah. He was well received or well referred. Uh, I gave it to him and he was, it turned out to be a great contractor. But anyway, to make a long story short, essentially the first one was done in six or seven months. And then when my agent went to take pictures of the property to sell it, this would have been about May of 2019. Yeah. Then he called me and just said, this is the worst rehab I've ever seen. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Who was checking on him? Well, the whole t- I had eight draw inspections, $150 a pop. So each time when it got inspected, I thought that meant it was of high quality. Uh, and yeah, so it, it, I'm not placing blame on anyone. I take full responsibility. It was just a, a bad situation. So anyway, it was one of these situations. I was out of cash at this point, you know, because we're fast forwarding eight or nine months. The second flip is underway and it's more in renovations than I inspect, uh, expected. And yeah. it's more than what I was allocated from the lender. Mm-hmm. And so each line item might have been, they might have given me 5K for roofing, but it cost me 6,500, right? You do that enough. And yeah. I, so I ran out of cash. So at this point I had no cash. Um, I was stuck because the first one couldn't sell. Yeah. I couldn't even list it. My agent said, there's no way we're listing this. So I had to ask my parents for 20 grand, received the 20 grand, and then got rid of the first contractor, the second contractor for the second property, paid him the 20 to go back to the first one and redo a bunch of work. Yeah. This time I had no money. So, I mean, we're talking every dollar that came into my pocket, I sent to the contractor first. Yeah. And then hoped like my tenants would pay, yeah. hope, my, hope I stayed at my job at the time. Yeah. So anyway, it, to make a long story short, I, I lost about 90 grand. 90? 90,000 dollars. Yeah. Like, I was 90,000 net and I was making 45 grand at a time. Holy Took 18 God. months to exit. Both yeah. of them. So yeah. yeah, that's why I say like your your advice is great. I'm just saying that, you know, unfortunately I had a much different experience. Yeah. And when it goes wrong, it can go wrong. A hundred percent. So and that, that set me back. I mean, we're talking 18 months just to get back to zero. Yeah. That was a very, very challenging time. And then thankfully I was able to pay my, my dad back and maybe another two two or three months later. So I mean yeah. we're talking like almost two years of full to get back to zero. Yeah. So some things, obviously mistakes, there was no one physically there checking on your behalf of like what is going on. So First rule, don't trust contractors. They need accountability. Uh, second rule, you didn't finish the first flip. It's a difference. That's It's super key for people to understand. When I say finish, that doesn't mean finish the rehab. That means list it, sell it, closed, you got paid, money's in the bank, then go buy a second property. You're absolutely right. Yeah. By the way, funny enough, both deals are actually good deals. If you take away the hard money costs, if I would have paid cash, I would have had like a 10% return. Yeah. They were actually good deal. What is what is a ten percent return though on like forty k? Well, ten percent on no no ten percent return on the total. I, th- I did the math one day. It was like on the total sales cost. Yeah, I would have made. It was I sold the both combined for maybe four hundred thousand, and oh, I would have made forty okay. k. So yeah, ten percent on the. Yeah. I don't know how you evaluate that. Whatever yeah. that number is, but yeah, yeah. If I would have paid cash for all of it, you would have had a decent return. Last tip I tell people about buying flips also is like, if you can, do not buy a heavy flip on your first go around. That's a huge mistake flippers make is they're like, this house needs everything. This is a perfect flip. It's like, no, dude, you could buy houses where you literally clean up, paint, replace the floors, maybe do the roof, and that's it. 
Like, don't. I did everything not what you advised. <laughs> <laughs> the first rehab was like 80,000 or yeah. how, maybe maybe even more. I don't remember now. But the second one was something like it got up to 150,000. Yeah. We're yeah. talking about like extreme flips in the in the Midwest. Yes. And where yeah. costs are a little lower too. So yeah. $150,000 rehab on a, and the house sold for 250. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that, so, cause I, I heard you on No Jumper and yeah. then I heard you say, oh, I'm going to go here cause it's less competition and it's cheaper. I was like, oh, that's not. I, At the time, I felt like that was the only way. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, I think you should invest in your backyard. Even if you don't have the money, raise the money or partner. When I started, I, I found someone who was flipping and I'm like, hey, Spence, I'll find the deal, but you have to like renovate and all that stuff and just pay me like 20% of whatever the net is. I agree. So I agree. Yeah. If you're playing the flipping game, man, looking back, that's probably the best way to get yeah. your feet wet enough, but the risk is so much lower. Yes. yes. And, and you can still lose money. Flipping houses is risky, period. Even if you partner, cause I had, I've had situations where I partnered and we actually lost and I had to pay the person back like Ouch. my, my loss. So that's and another philosophically. I'm very much a do first and then figure it out later. And I know over the long haul, that type of strategy will work out. It's just occasionally you're going to, you're going to lose. Yeah. You're going to take big L's. Yeah. So let me confront you more on house hacking. Yeah. Love it. I, why wouldn't you just scale apartments instead of scaling? What do you mean by scaling apartments? Like raising money? Like raising money and buying a bunch of apartments or even I, like making money and then putting 20, 30% down on an apartment. I think my strategy has worked best for me along my path in life. And so I don't, I don't disagree. Like, I think the opportunity is way bigger with the apartments. It's just, mm -hmm. it all started with house hacking. And then when I sold the condo, I went into a seven bed house on a lease purchase agreement. Yeah. And so I started doing that and I just, I love house hacking. I love the idea of it. And that became my thing. I also thought that, I don't know, I could grow it into like some type of education yeah. as well. Yeah. If I were to able to grow the system mm -hmm. where I would consider myself an expert. Yeah. To me that I wouldn't consider myself truly an expert until I was able to um hire employees and and okay. offload it. But anyway, anyway, to yeah. really answer your question, I've never really bought apartments and I don't like the idea of raising money but for you something I've never well, would you count that? I'm I'm refer I'm think I'm seeing you referring like five when you say apartments, I'm yeah. thinking like say multi family. Family. Yeah. I should have said multi family. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really comfortable with the idea of raising money. And that the thing was with like my YouTube channel that was never really about real estate or about me. Yeah. And so I and I never really wanted to sell. I just felt like there was so much risk. And I I, I didn't really I wasn't in the real estate game of like finding apartment deals. So I did yeah. consider myself an expert. Yeah. And I would be very uncomfortable raising money to yeah. do something that I haven't done myself. Yeah. But why not like just use your own money? I haven't had money to be able to buy any apartments. All my all my house hacks have been Low down payment. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, then that makes more sense. That makes more sense. So you talked about not being an ex expert in house hacking. I would consider you an expert in house hacking. I, I think I am. I'm saying to sell an education, educational program, I would want myself internally, I would want to reach a point where I have it uh, outsourced so that I could have a complete system of starting yeah. to outsourcing yeah. and that being the end goal. Yeah. I disagree with you on that also. Okay. I think if if you've had success house hacking, I, and I don't personally know your business, so yeah. maybe there's things I just don't know. Yeah. But if you have done it successfully for how long? Which I have, six years. How are you not an expert? That's fair. And how, yeah, like at what point, like 10 years? Like what's, and then even most people don't even house hack to the point where someone else is running the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Most people are like you when they first started where they just want to know how to offset. Yeah, just break even and then move on to something else. Exactly. You're right. So if I were you, I would consider making a, uh, if you want to, a low budget, like a, a low cost course, 500 bucks or whatever, mm -hmm. and say, hey, you know what? If you feel like this is not a value, I'll refund you. But at yeah, least I agree. could help people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's something I'm looking forward to in 2023. Yeah. Is yeah. maybe by the end of the year, I'm going to start considering it for sure. Yeah, I, I would because I think, I know the gurus, and we'll talk about this later, they get a, a stigma, but you could change someone's life. Yes. And you could be potentially keeping someone in a tough situation by holding information that could change their life. Exactly. I agree. That's, That's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. For sure. And keep in mind that my whole platform has been kind of anti-fake guru. And so I was yeah. very concerned about coming up with my own course. And then 
audiences will turn on you, man, on YouTube. Yeah. And yeah. audiences will turn very oh, quickly. Man. And it's not even about like, you could literally give the best refund policy. You could sell it for $10. But the second you start selling something as a guru, yeah. uh, and I, I don't know what that number is. Maybe it's only half a percent of the audience. Maybe it's only 500 people. But yeah. the, the concern is that you you know, rub enough people the wrong way and maybe they just stop following you. But who cares? Well, when your platform is YouTube, you, your concern is always, are people still following you? Is it though? Yeah, absolutely. Because, okay, I see people, okay, let's just stick to the course thing and then we'll get yeah, into yeah. YouTube. So, like, I, I guess I already covered it. I would do something super low budget and super friendly re refund policy so that way so that way you feel like personally hey look like if you don't like it yeah take no the risk. money back yeah exactly take it back and then that way you're helping the people who want it and then you're refunding the people that didn't enjoy it so i would if sold right, dude, i'll do it Perfect. Perfect. all right here we go <laughs> okay so okay we talk about youtube i'm i'm i am not a youtuber i'm a real estate investor who barely just made their first youtube video but i'm seeing that I think it looks like kind of like a toxic place and it almost seems a little bit intimidating where it seems like if you have success, then you get people who want to just bring you down and, you know, put the thumbnails of you. With it's very fire. humbling. Yeah, it's very humbling once you, once people realize that they can get a lot of views by just using your name and, yeah. and title and thumbnail. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, and I will say like, <clears throat> I know your content is like calling out gurus, but I also think your content is unbiased. Very much where so. Where I've seen other people who, like, I don't, I'm not going to say names, but let's just, I'm going to take an influencer like me, Kevin. They'll make a video about me, Kevin saying, oh, like his, his financial stuff is terrible. He, he's an idiot. Like just, it's all subjective. It's all hate. And I'm like, dude, like, what and value it, are you really bringing? Yeah, it, it doesn't bring value and it just spreads hate. And I'm like, like, this is bad. And and the worst part is it gets views and people in the comments are supporting what they're saying. And I'm like, I don't get it. I have this chat with some of my big YouTube friends quite often. And okay. I think it is very, very tied to public sentiment. And right now, if you look at the psychology of money, if you, are you familiar with this chart, the psychology of money that shows where, okay, so I'll show it to you after this. It's fascinating. So it shows where kind of the emotions are at during a market cycle. Yeah. And right now, um, I believe we're tied to the anger phase, which is a lot of people are struggling. Public sentiment is really negative. Like if you look at the news, the world's falling. We've had world war recently. Uh, interest mm -hmm. rates have risen. People don't feel like the average person feels like they cannot buy a house. That is not a good place to be in in America. Sure. And so if you if you try to understand l the large group of people that makes up America, makes up the audience on YouTube, yeah. the public sentiment right now is very negative. And so the the topics and the content that are working on YouTube right now are fire and anger. Yeah. Hence, what thumbnails are working right now? Yeah. Anything with fire. Yeah. Anything with anger. Anything with vitriol. Yeah. Why? Because it is playing into the public sentiment at large which we believe, my, my friends believe, is, is in, a, in a tough spot. And I have a lot of empathy for these people. You know, the, it, a lot of people are really struggling right now. Empathy so, for the YouTubers? And, no, empathy for the the general people, public, the general public yeah. watching this. And, and right now we've had a few situations where, you know, people have lost money following influencers that have maybe some advice they've had or an NFT project they've started. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of empathy for the people losing money, man. It's tough. And so they see these influencers doing yeah. well. Yeah. And they're the, and, and a lot of people think in the life of an influencer, life of a YouTuber is very easy. And so I th the the optics are obviously very, very yeah. negative, right? You have influencer making money, the followers of them losing money based on something they recommended or something they built, an NFT project or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and you see a, a lot of people are really upset. And so that's why a lot of people who are succeeding financially right now are, are targets. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it makes it makes me honestly like not want to do it, dude. It's dude, it's it's bad. It's it, really bad. Hey, yeah. I so I stopped reading all comments. I had to yeah. stop a month ago. It's yeah. just it's not worth it. Yeah, there's no benefit at all. Yeah, yeah. And I've I've had videos about me recently, which has been a very interesting and unique experience. Yeah, I'm very thankful for. It's made me appreciate my position a lot more in yeah. the sense that. I feel like I've been nothing but objective to all the 100%. subjects in my videos. Yeah, and it's also made me. Um, understand and think more responsibly with my platform. Yeah. Um, once you have videos made about you where they are sharing things that aren't necessarily true and they never reached out for comment or they're, they they could easily reach out for comment to get like my side of the story or yeah. to let me share exactly what happened. And yeah. once you realize that that's not the case, it's made me realize 
maybe there's been flaws with stuff I've done. Yeah. Maybe there's been instances where I should have reached out to someone yeah. before making a video on them. And so I'm trying to do a better job at that. Yeah. And that I I also did think about that too, where like your your style, like I said, even though it is <clears throat> objective, you are calling people out. Yes. And you're almost like creating that environment i'm in the space man yeah i i totally agree and in a way i feel partly guilty even me kevin like i'm a big fan of me kevin um and but he used to do you know grant cardone this courses are this yeah but but let me tell you let me tell you though the public sentiment is so different like my my feel of the pulse i feel like is very intuitive and very very close to like reality Uh in the sense that I have been watching comments for years. I've been on YouTube as a fan for 10 years. Like somebody who's watched so much content yeah. and I've never seen it this negative. Yeah. I've never seen this amount of like negative videos yeah. perform really well. Yeah. I think my belief is that it is tied to market sentiment. Yeah, I think I think I could see that. I could see that. And I think also, like I said, if, <clears throat> if you're calling people out, you're setting yourself up to eventually I agree. be targeted. That's why I'm trying to pivot. I'm trying to pivot away what into like larger stories, more mm-hmm. business focused or larger stories, more investment. And you can still keep the same sentiment of like, yeah. why, um, for example, a video I'm working on is why cryptocurrency was the worst investment of 2022. Yeah. And that's a video that kind of stays within the same realm with which I operate. Yeah. However, it's not a targeted attack at one person. Yeah. But, but it's very clear what gets views now. Public influencer who's very large, who did something wrong, gets views. That sucks. Hopefully, hopefully that it doesn't last too long. But it won't. Yeah. It won't. It's only tied to the the cycles, I think. And it, it gets old, man. That's the thing is it gets old. Like mm-hmm. at some point you just get tired of watching. Yeah. It's super negativity. Toxic. And, and I'll, yeah. I'll totally admit that there is a negative tint to my content when you're a critic like I have been. Yeah. It, there is a negative tint and I totally understand that criticism. Yeah. yeah. But... Yeah, but like I said, with some of like one of my uh, favorite videos that you made was you were talking about is uh, LeBron James and Steph Curry yeah underpaid, overpaid or underpaid yeah, yeah 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 and I was like I never thought about it like that I yeah thinking, so I love I would love to go back to those style of videos which yeah. is kind of like uncovering a truth but it's not yeah. like a targeted video or it's not super negative yeah yeah and it was like informative very much so you, you do research you do different things to to try to give information where, like I said, there's some videos where it's literally like, this person sucks, they're a scam, and you shouldn't listen to them. It's like, yeah. okay. Yep. And last thing about the scam, I can't stand when people say scam. I hate it's the that. most over-abused I word. I hate that. I'm like, dude, I see- Especially for something that has a refund policy, man. Yeah. Like, if it has a good refund policy and people are upset and they get a refund, like, yeah, yeah, okay, you could argue, like, maybe they uh, wasted a little time and energy. Yeah. But if you get your money back- How much time and energy? Not as much as you're wasting on social media, I bet. Yeah. It's hard to call something a scam. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that that word is so overabused that it is irrelevant. Yeah, it just just gets me fired up. But, um, okay, so let's let's talk to the the younger demographic, like Austin here, who- (laughs) who want to get into YouTube, like what, what has been your journey like as far as like making it a career? I started releasing videos January, 2015. So it's, I didn't make a first, my first dollar for five years. Uh, I was hustling, man. Yeah. yeah. So what, another thing about YouTube is it used to be a fun side gig for almost everyone. It was like this fun little community yeah. that you made videos for fun because there was no money. There was no ad censor. Yeah. No one knew that you could start selling like the idea of, oh, these are all eyeballs that could buy a product that I sell. Yeah. So it was always fun. Yeah. And that's why like the, the community is so different now, so much more professionalized. So many people have sunk money into it. Yeah. But anyway, I think that if you're going to start, you have to sink money into it. I think there's, my belief on YouTube is that there's six to 12 months remaining for like the average person to start a YouTube channel in their room. Okay. I six think to six to 12 months left before. Really? Yeah. I think, I think there is so much money being poured into the platform and so many people with money have realized that they can invest into their, into their channel. Yeah. And the production value is so high, even for channels that don't get many views, like the production value of the, the, the low, like I'm talking about the barrier to entry right now is so high. Yeah. I think it is so incredibly challenging. Yeah. Even like, look at the studio. yeah, this is ridiculous. I mean, my, I was so lucky just two years ago, I started in my bedroom with terrible backdrops. Yeah. My production value was so bad. I didn't even know how to do audio and lighting. Yeah. And I was getting views today that I would get 50 views max. So do you still think it's a good idea? Yes, to get but, 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 yeah. but here's the benefit. The eyeballs have never been, there's never been as many eyeballs 
Yeah. There's never been this many opportunity. People are also more comfortable with the idea of buying from influencers or buying a product like, hey, I'm an expert tax accountant or whatever, and yeah. I can help file your taxes for you. Yeah. Like this, this is very common now. So you can start. So what I'm really getting at is I think if you were to start YouTube today, you yeah. start with monetization in mind. You have to, because AdSense is so incredibly hard to live off of. It's going to be so hard to get enough views moving forward to live off of AdSense that you have to sell from the start. So whether that's a product or a service or an affiliate, I think you have to start. And that way you can detach from views. Someone starting out is not going to get views. But if if you can uh, just focus on maybe getting a thousand views a video... Yeah. Which I believe everyone has the capability of doing. That's my goal right now. Yeah. If you can get a thousand views a video and you sell a product or service and one person buys every video, I mean, you said you're a real estate agent. Like think of being a real estate agent. If you only did house tour videos in Las Vegas yeah. and did market updates and you got 500 views, but five people every video reached out as a possible client, what's that worth? Yeah. Wow. That's a crazy, crazy value. Yeah. Right. But that's all I just mentioned. You only getting 500 views a video. Yeah. I couldn't live off that. Because I'm focused on AdSense. So anyway, that's uh, step one is figuring out your monetization model. Yeah, there's, I want to talk about short form later. I just don't want to forget. But like, do you make videos because you love making videos or you do it like for a business? For a business, for sure at this point. Yeah, because it, it, everything gets repetitive. Yeah. Like I, of course, started because I enjoyed it. And then it becomes a business. It becomes your job. It becomes your career. So there's aspects of it I don't enjoy. There are aspects of it I do enjoy. Like what? Uh, I love what it offers as far as experiences, the people I get to meet, the yeah. opportunities that are presented. A couple weeks ago, about a month ago, I went to a UFC event, got to stay in a <laughs> in a suite because yeah. someone I met through my content w- w- is yeah. a fan of my stuff. I become friends with them and he invited me to the event. Yeah. I didn't pay a dollar. I got to go see a UFC fight yeah. in a suite. Yeah. Stuff like that. You get to meet awesome people, very successful people, people that are way more successful in rooms I get to enter yeah. that are I should not be entering just based off where I'm at in life, but yeah. I do because they like my content. Yeah, yeah. And you never know who's watching. Yeah. Yeah. I know who's watching. Yeah. Even I, I barely just started making Instagram Mm -hmm. reels this year and, uh, it's kind of made life a little bit easier. Like if I need something, I'll post like, Hey, does anyone know a good CPA or a restaurant or good anything? And I like instantly get feedback and help and support. I ask, Hey, like I'm moving. Does anyone want to help? I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Like people will show up for it. Because it's eyeballs. Yeah. Once you get a lot of eyeballs, then you can just send out an offer. Yeah. So what do you think is like the the future of influence and how does that, like, can you can you grow influence just with short form? I don't do any short form right now. Okay, why You might be able to. Um, I, I was doing short form on TikTok. Yeah. I just don't like it. Yeah. I think shorts are going to be inevitable in 2023. Yeah, I've been financially hampered by a lawsuit I'm involved in, so yeah. I've I've had to really like figure out where to allocate resources. So yeah, yeah. to really answer your question, I don't have the money to hire someone to do that because I just don't have an immediate ROI. I don't have the bandwidth. Uh, I don't, my brain doesn't think in that way either. Like yeah. I'm not skilled at short form. But anyway, I think short form is a way to 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 definitely grow. It's a way to get more eyeballs that are yeah. not on your content today. Yeah, we still haven't figured out as a YouTube community if the short form eyeballs convert into long term eyeballs, I which is how you have. really make. Yeah. Money. The the benefit of short term is or short form is that you you get your name and your brand out to more people. Yeah. Which wider. you could argue like yeah. the Grant Cardone method, which yeah. is just I want everyone to know who I am. Yeah. And inevitably you're gonna have a certain people are gonna be cast yeah. in the net yeah. or whatever. That's why I think Ryan did well. So yes. Ryan Ryan has a million followers on TikTok, and, but then you know, he tries to get them to to watch his longer form because that's when you become like a raving fan. Yes. You, but you have to have a funnel if you can yeah. justify the the short form. Because if you're just throwing up TikToks, yeah, no yeah. purpose, yeah, you're not going to make any money, yeah. So I was I was spending money doing that, and I just didn't have an ROI, so it was it was hard to keep doing it. Yeah, I don't think uh, I I honestly don't think I'll ever want to rely on like social media for income because I feel like it's such a like it's a get me- cancel. Oh, dude, like, it's so you can't hard cancel my rent. Right. During, well, you could because they did for a little bit. That's right. During uh, it's a very unhealthy relationship, man. And I thought about this the other day. So my views are down about fifty percent. Really? Like, most people are. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think YouTube and social media in general, are kind of going back to the pre-pandemic days. Yeah. Because the pandemic was like our industry on steroids. Yeah. It, yeah. We got so lucky yeah. in that regard. Yeah. And and so I think the views are kind of going back to normal or yeah. what should be more normal. And so yeah, my views are down. And and I thought of this of how unhealthy it is to rely on the perception of hundreds of thousands of people 
for your income. Like yeah. I, I need the validation of people watching my stuff. Like, yeah. I don't want to live that life long no. term. It's not healthy. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to start monetizing better. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to start selling. I have sponsors. So those yeah. help, but yeah, I'm yeah. certainly going to start selling business products and services. So Grant Cardone was here and he said a quote, uh, something like, uh, people usually turn into something that they start off hating. And it's funny because I even, like I said, with me, Kevin, with you, like, I feel like you guys were anti-monetization before, but now you're starting to move. To well, it's a, nece- it's a necessity. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It sucks, man. AdSense dropping. I made $4,300 last month on AdSense. Uh-huh. I, my legal bill was 15000 and my editor's 2200 So you do the math. Yeah. I spent four times on what I made. Yeah. Because huh. I, I had no sponsors. Do, do you mind me asking how much you made on YouTube 2020? 2022, I made about 180,000 from AdSense. I made 80,000 from sponsors. Okay. And then there was another 20 or 30,000 from like affiliates or just some various other sources. I got paid to to make a video because it took longer than expected. So like little things like that. So what do you call it? There'll be 260 or so total. That's That's high income though. Yeah, I'm very thankful. Oh yeah, yeah, but but it's it's very short term. Dude, YouTube is very short term. Yeah. Very short term. Yeah. If you have a career, for, if you're relevant for three to five years, that is a success. But, and I'm coming up on year three. <laughs> but my question is, you know how you're like, oh, I don't have the, the funds to yeah. make these big things. But if you're house hacking and your expenses are so low and your cash flow and you're making high income, then like, where's my money? Yeah, going? what are you doing? Yeah, what? Well, investing in? Uh, my lawyer is who I'm oh, investing in. Okay, I've spent $210,000. No way. See the math. What? Two hundred ten thousand dollars in a lawsuit. What? That sucks, dude. Yeah. So that uh, that is the answer. It has been a nothing, yeah. but it's been an incredibly challenging time. What advice would you give to people, if anything? I don't have any. Oh, really? The problem is lawsuits. You can't be avoided. If, yeah. If some true. rich guy wants to screw you, he will literally he can file a lawsuit and screw you. Yeah, there's you know. there's nothing you can do. You yeah. have to defend yourself, or you face a judgment. And by defending yeah. yourself, you open yourself up to large legal bills. There's no way to defend. It's it's the hardest thing I've ever dealt with. So would you like not target big people if you don't have No, to? there's nothing you can do. Like you don't know who's going to sue. You also, yeah. you could do all the measures to not be liable. Yeah. But that doesn't mean someone won't sue. Yeah. You could you could make a video about Facebook and they sue you. I'm not saying they would, but yeah, my yeah. point is that like this idea of like avoiding lawsuits just isn't a thing. I know. You never know who could sue. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a challenge. And plus you don't want to run your business with like, oh, maybe he'll sue. So I'll stay away from that video. Like, yeah. I'm in the business of of making entertaining content and trying to help people stay away from scams and yeah. fraudsters. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes there's backlash to that. Yeah. So even in real estate, like I've been sued. I think I'm in a lawsuit right now. I don't even remember. I've I've had lawsuits with past employees. I've had all types of crap. I so yeah, you cannot I also hired the best. So my expenses are certainly higher. I luckily so my strategy is subtle. That's yeah. my, and, and, and maybe later on, this is going to get clipped up and like, oh, look how bad he is. But like, I've had like, let's just say a, a, a business partner sue me for, these are small amounts, like, oh, small claims court. So I'll just be like, you know what, dude, I'll pay you whatever, half and just. That is the answer. Yeah. Just yeah. end it on yeah. one. Yeah. Eat the, you take the ego hit. You're just yeah. like, dude, yeah. I'm, I'm going to yeah. eat this loss, even though I'm in the right. Yep. You pay it off and you're done. Yep. The mental energy, I mean, especially a business guy like you, like yeah. the mental energy probably could have cost you multiple flips. Uh-huh. Like if you're spent time, I need to see your lawyers. I need to see the contract. I need yeah. to see your conversations and all this. It's yeah. energy. No. Stay away. So I got, I don't, I don't know if I should talk about my lawsuits, but maybe we could bleep this out. But I, I got sued one time for cold calling. Okay. Bleep it out. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But the guy was a professional litigator. So... Long story short, he sent me a letter to pay him, we'll say, 15K. And I, Mr. Big Ego, Mr. Making All This Money, was like, I'm not paying this guy. I'll pay an attorney. Let's go to court. Paid an attorney. Attorney reaches out to him to try to settle. The, my, I didn't know the attorney very well, but they came at him, like, kind of harsh. And he knew what he was doing. He's like, no, forget you. Like, let's go to court. I ended up paying the attorney more than what it, what I ended up settling the guy for. So I was like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I was like, damn, I should have. And and I settled with him on one call. I at first I didn't contact him because I didn't know the the process. But then when I saw the money start to add up for the lawsuit and like him like requesting stuff from us, 
I called them. I was like, hey, dude, you know what? Like, I apologize. I shouldn't have did that. Blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't think it's right. I don't think that I should be getting sued for this. But like, can we settle? Well, that's what I wanted. And I want X amount. I was like, okay. You yeah, paid, man. And it was done. It's done. One phone call. But I was, you know, hired an attorney and was Googling, you know, laws. And it just ended up like. Waste of time and energy. Yeah. And, yeah. And money. So, yeah, it's been an incredibly challenging time. For yeah. Me. Well, 2023, we're going to crush it. So Yeah, it's going to be a big year. Yeah. So, okay. So last topic I guess we'll talk about is investments in 2023. So you've you've done real estate. What else have you done? I actually invested in a small business here okay. in Las Vegas. Uh, friends that I, well, guys I became friends with, they're in a industry that I wanted to start myself. So it's in business credit cards. So they're okay. consultants for getting business credit cards for small business owners. Okay. And it's a business I want to start on my own, but I realized my talent is not in starting businesses. Yeah. And so I invested a nice amount into that company. Uh-huh. And I, my intentions with it, not only I want to own or be co-owner of that type of business, but also because I want to use the ability to reach a lot of eyeballs on yeah. my YouTube channel to promote businesses that I have an equity stake in. Yeah. And so that's the plan. I will, I have two more injections in 2023. So to answer your question on my investments, I still have two more with that one. Yeah. And then I'll be fully vested. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm really excited about that one. I think that, that one might be one of the biggest investments I make. And the the challenge, with the, anyway, just yeah. a quick note, like kind of a positive note to end kind of the negative talk about lawsuit. Yeah. I view everything as like a possible blessing in disguise. Yeah. And so I feel like life is like a pendulum. Yeah. And occasionally you're going to have the pendulum go in the negative. Oh, yeah. And uh, if you take big risks, you flip houses and you have a, a big negative, I think life yeah. has a way of pendling, having the pendulum swing back. Yes. And so if you never take risks, like your pendulum's like negative one, and then it'll, it'll swing back to one. Yeah. yeah. But if you take big risks or you have yep. big losses, yep. somehow life has a way of, if you're a good person, you do the right thing and you treat yeah. people well. Yeah. I believe in all those principles. I think life has a way of swinging back in your favor. 100%. And I, in what I've experienced, I feel like I've had a few really big negative moments. Yeah. And I feel like at some point I'm going to have just something really happen in my life where I, I just... I'd wake up and just, I'm incredibly fortunate for that event. Whatever that is, it hasn't happened yet. And I think that's going to happen. I hope it happens this year. I think it will. I think as long as you like, like you said, be a good person, be open it. You treat people well. You don't screw anyone over. Yeah. I've never, no one's been damaged by anything I've done. Yeah. I've never scored anyone. Hard. Yeah. All that stuff. Um, Try to bring value to the world in the way, any ways you can. Yeah. And, and like, I've, like I said, I've gone through lawsuits. I've gone through breakups. I've gone through a lot of, tough times where I'm like literally screaming in my car like crap like why is this happening to me like like why like yes. everyone else is successful yep. everyone else is making money everyone else is doing all this crap and I'm stuck here doing this crap with this you know customer that hates me even as a realtor and I'm like god like why is this happening to me but like you said like when you go through those hard times it's crazy you'll go through success that most people will never feel because they never go through those hard times. You got to be in the arena to to play. And sometimes yeah. you, you take an L, but occasionally life will have a way of giving you a W. So business, real estate, is there anything else that you're investing in? I'm hopefully going to have the lawsuit done soon. Yeah. If that's the case, then yeah. all the money from YouTube will continue going. I was thinking real estate. Yeah. I don't know if real estate's the play right now for yeah. me. Yeah. I, and I, I'm not sure exactly Why? sure. Um, so my model of, of house hacking rent by room is buying in the $500 to $600,000 price range, uh-huh. buying in the Southwest yeah. down by Blue Diamond. That's my area. And, I would uh, never say Riley. Oh yeah. And, and so what I do is I add, I take a loft and add a wall for about four grand and yeah. convert it to a six bedroom. Yeah. So I'm at about 4,700 a month gross rent. Yeah. But with the, with the way costs are, I'm going to need to put in $150,000 down for uh, furniture, because I furnish. So yeah. for furniture, down payment, all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, 150 grand to make like $300 a month or $500 a month. I don't know if it's worth it. That's why I said the whole house hacking yeah. thing in the beginning. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I agree in that regard. Yeah. So, But that's one way and I can cost seg so I get massive tax advantages. So my real returns are actually pretty insane. So that's one option. Yeah. Or I love the idea of buying small businesses or starting a business yeah. or investing back in my content. Yeah. So the, these are all ideas I've had. Yeah, I mean, okay, but... Don't you have a short-term rental also? I do, yeah. So I have three rent by rooms and a short-term rental How in Airbnb. Doing? Really well. I just got paid sixty one hundred from the month of December. So and wait, that's why, that's why after you injury. Do that? Well, you're only allowed one in Vegas. Oh, but why not go s- somewhere else? That's an option too. 
There you go. For sure. Yeah. These are all, so I haven't had the ability to really think through investing because yeah. my legal bills have been more than I've making. Yeah. So that, I I can't even afford to think about investing. So hopefully you when could, that- You what, could if you get creative. Although that risk, no. that risk. No, 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 no. That's too risk. When you have, when you have a black cloud, like you have to solve that first. Yeah. yeah so yeah, when yeah, that's yeah. gone, then I can finally sit back and, and evaluate where I'm at in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And think things through. Yeah. I don't know what the best investing strategy would be. Yeah. Real estate is always on my mind. Yeah. That's I one. The burst strategy, baby. Yeah. And, and maybe yeah. I get, maybe I try to find a flip or something. Yeah. A flip or, to or burger. Like, like, a, like, because like tie back to the very beginning, if you could burr and that 150K instead of getting sunk into the house to make $300, like be able to pull it back. You're absolutely right. That's, that's the only way I see to scale unless you're like a freaking- yeah, like a million dollars. Yeah, or yeah. Unless you're making millions of dollars, even if you make millions of dollars, like you, that strategy is so hard. It is. You just you're like, absolutely right about the yeah everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe that's an option. Maybe I look at uh, maybe I contact Ray in this office, and I'm like, yeah. Yo, Ray, find me some deals, dude. I also I'll send you some deals. Yeah, yeah. But um, what about stocks? Zero. Crypto? Zero. So but the did way you do them before? No. Oh, okay. The way yeah. I've done one year I did I invested in stocks and made 10%. And I was like, yeah. this is boring. Yeah. I like active income. Yeah. So the way I evaluate investing is where is my edge? Do I have an edge in this niche? Yeah. And if I if I don't have an edge, I don't participate. So like the stock yeah. market, I don't know how to beat the market. Therefore, I'm not going to participate. Yeah. With YouTube, I felt like I could outwork everyone, out hustle everyone to in, to a point where I can succeed. Yeah. I did that. With house hacking, I feel like I have an edge in the real estate space of making outsized returns, yeah. which I do. I make about 100% return on my on my house hacks because yeah. every year I buy owner-occupied and move. Yeah. And so with cost segs, with the tax advantages, I make 100%. Like you can't match that anywhere yeah. else. Yeah. So that's my investment strategy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so to answer your question, I don't have an edge in those markets, so I don't yeah. participate. Yeah. I'm the same way. Honestly, like I'm all in on real estate. Good. Like, if that's your edge, yeah. why do anything yeah. else? And I've tried to go the crypto and the little other things, and then it ends up burning me. What about NFTs? Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, yeah, so, like, just crypto stocks, other stuff like that, even, like, other businesses that I am i don't have a competitive advantage, it never works out. I'm like... I'll tell you the killer is... You can buy like plumbing companies, electric companies. Yeah. That would be sick to have all of the renovations, your company. I don't want to do that. Oh man. I'm just thinking some of these like small businesses here in town that are like plumbing companies that are doing a million a year. Yeah. Right. If you could go buy everything. Well, whatever the numbers are. I'm just saying like you, you can buy a company that's, that's already generated. They've got a business. Yeah. They have uh, customers. Yeah. You could buy that. And then now that's your company that whenever you need. Yeah. Well, I try to, I, before I do anything, I try to look into the scalability of it. And for me, I want to make seven figures net. I don't care if it makes all this other 100K a month, gross, all this crap. Like I have to make seven figures because that's what I want to make. And I feel like we're young. Why not freaking aim for high income? Love it. I, I feel like seven figures is a new six figures. Like back in the 80s, people wanted to make 100K. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like entrepreneurs nowadays could... That's the new benchmark. Yeah, that's the new, a totally arbitrary yeah, number, but exactly. yeah. Exactly. And, and, and like the millionaire, like you're not balling yeah. in 2022. If Especially if it's equity in real estate that's yeah. little cash flow. Exactly. And then even like, I'm, I I lived in California. If you make a million dollars, you're truly net a million dollars. You're paying half to the government. So... You really need to make like 1.5 to 2. Yeah. And then, if you own your house, your property tax is yep. really like 55%. Yep. And then, and then, okay, you make 2 million, all right, but then you have to pay, you have to buy rentals to do the cost seg. So it just, even though real estate's like slow and steady, it's still, I think, the, the best vehicle. I don't believe. I think it, it is. Yeah. I don't believe in the S&P 500. I think it is too. Crypto and all that crap. Okay. Very last question. What do you feel like your purpose is in life? Um, even, or your purpose of your YouTube or the purpose of your new business that you're... The creating. purpose of YouTube was from the start to evaluate all of the gurus, or essentially the people selling you stuff, to evaluate who's the good guy and who's, who's the bad guy, essentially. That what was your purpose? Yeah, that was my purpose at the time yeah. when I started it. Uh, I haven't really thought about that in life. I, I don't get into those types of like oh, you don't thoughts. I don't... No? I don't really care. No? To be honest, yeah. Okay. What my purpose is. Yeah. What no, about- I don't know. We're on this planet. For, I'm very um, nihilistic in a way where it's just like we're on this planet very short term. Like oh. get out of what you can. Yeah. 
be a good person to the people around you yeah. the best you can. That's, yeah. I don't know. That's the extent of my thought on the on that topic. Okay. And then what is the purpose of your new business? The one I'm buying equity in? Yeah. Hopefully to make money. Okay. But what, like, what is, but the, the company's purpose is to like help. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. To, to help consumers. So small agency owners, small business owners generally have lack access to capital. Yeah. And so their value is they help customers go out and get large business credit cards at 0%. Yeah. And so on your own, you, the general question is, why don't you do this on your own? Well, you could, you might be able to get five or $10,000 credit cards and, and okay, that's okay. But with their help, you can get access to 50 to a hundred thousand and their strategies with that they can offer that allows you after a year when the interest period kicks in yeah. that you can transfer over to a different card that gives you the 0% period for another 12 months. Uh-huh. And so their value is, is helping small business owners get access to capital to grow their business. God. So their purpose is, is helping small business owners. And your prob- your purpose is probably the same. You just didn't realize it, that you're trying to help people from not being. Yeah. And I to tie it into real estate, I, I do think I have a purpose there, which is to be a good ethical landlord and to yeah. ease people's current problems, current financial problems. Because with the house hacking method, you generally attract people that if they're willing to live in a house with five or six other people, yeah, they need- they're not in a great financial yeah. position. Yeah. So I don't really say this publicly much, but like I dropped rent on half of my tenants. Yeah. I drop rent. When I, yeah. if I can sense they're struggling, I will drop rent. Yeah. Uh, when COVID hit, I dropped rent. Yeah. I don't ever raise rent a dollar. Yeah. And so, yeah, I could make more money with the house hack method. I could probably do better. I'm struggling financially because of my lawsuit right yeah. now. And I still drop rent on people because I, I can see them suffering. And I don't like a lot of landlord practices where they yeah. extract as much money. Oh, every year I can add $25 a month. Yeah. And I don't like that practice. And so, yeah, I think my purpose in the real estate space Yeah. To tie into like the house hacking model, why I love it so much and why I've been such a proponent of it is I think if you do right, I think you can really help a lot of people struggling. I think the average person now is finding it harder to rent on their own. And so they're going to need to find a place to live that is affordable and is nice. And so I offer a really nice, affordable place to live. Yeah. And I think that's becoming more and more valuable. Yeah. And I, I see it. I'm, I'm in the game. I've, I've dealt with 50 or 60 tenants at this point. Yeah. I've dealt with a lot of people applying for rental whenever I have an opening. Mm-hmm. So I have my pulse on kind of this subset of the population. Yeah. And I sense that people are, dude, my tenants now are awesome. People are always like, well, who lives with you? It must suck. Dude, I have a guy who's in real estate that makes, he's going to make half a million this year. I have another guy who's an awesome bartender, a lawyer, uh, a girl who sells high-end art on the strip and a high-end pilot. Yeah. Those are awesome tenants. Yeah. But yeah. they're all renting in a house with six people. Why? Because rent is getting crazy. Yeah. It's becoming more and more difficult to justify living on your own. So anyway, yeah. my pur- yeah, I, now that you've brought this up, I, yeah, I feel like I do have a little bit of a purpose in the real you space. You just did. Even in your YouTube. Yeah. I don't want to keep going, but even in your, you're trying to help people yeah. not get scammed or lose money. So maybe yeah. your purpose is helping people. You just yeah. didn't realize it. Yeah. That's um, very nice of you to bring that up. There we go.